Thank you. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Chandru Ayer. I head up business development for the South Asia Business Group at Grant Thornton. And it's a pleasure for me to welcome you all today on behalf of Grant Thornton, on behalf of the High Commission of India and FICI for the launch of the second edition of India in the UK, the Diaspora Effect Report, also lovingly called by us as version 2.0. Her Excellency High Commissioner of India to the UK, uh, Gayatri Yesar Kumar, uh, Deputy High Commissioner, Mr. Ghosh, uh, Baroness Prasher, Chair of the FIKI UK Council, uh, my colleague Anuj Chande, uh, Head of the South Asia Business Group at Grant Thornton, and all my loving, um, wonderful representatives of the Indian diaspora community here in the UK. And also for all those who are joining us live from across six countries today, over 200 people joining us online for the launch of this report. Thank you very much for joining us. It's kind of a deja vu moment today. It's the 4th of March. And I go back to two years ago, the 4th of February 2020 at the Guild Hall in London, where we launched the first edition of this report. We had over 200 people attending that event in person. And we didn't know at that time that that would be the last large physical event of any kind before the pandemic stuck. Two years later, everything is fine, at least looks good now. And we are back together to do this physical launch of the second edition of the report. And it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you all today to this wonderful uh, India House building. Thank you, ma'am, for hosting us. This report is an extension of the previous report that we did. Um, the previous report was more factual in nature. For the first time ever, there was a report that came out which quantified the contribution of the Indian diaspora across the UK. And some of the numbers, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the numbers are a lot more higher. But still, 65,000 companies, 654 companies turning over 100,000 pounds, total consolidated revenues almost touching 40 billion, employing over 200,000 people. But the numbers are just mind boggling. But then what we wanted to do in this aspect of the report was to just go to the softer aspects of it, try to see, okay, what those numbers look like actually. So we interviewed 14 of the entrepreneurs who represent some of the seven key sectors where the Indian diaspora has done wonderfully well in the UK. But I won't uh, steal the thunder from Anuj, who is going to talk more about the findings of this year's report. But before we do that, can I request our High Commissioner of India to the UK, uh, Ms. Gatri Sarkumar, to give her welcome remarks. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Right Honorable Baroness Prasher, Chair of FIKI UK Council, Sri Anuj Chande of Grant Thornton, distinguished guests, my colleagues and I warmly welcome you all back to India House. This is the very first such event, a uh, normal event where we have a normal gathering and I could um, hear the decibels upstairs on the third floor when you all entered and it was the happiest sound that I've heard in the last 18 months of my being posted here. So very, very happy to see you all here with us and um, to see you in person. At the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Grant Thornton and uh, Fiki UK for this initiative in publishing India in the UK, the diaspora effect 2.0. Uh, we'll be hearing about the details. Uh, this report actually celebrates the success of our diaspora in the UK and appropriately brings us 14 cases, um, case studies they could be, uh, but 14 stories that are unique, but collectively, uh, individually they are unique, but collectively they are inspiring because they all have one common thread and that is a sense of purpose indefatigable drive and a huge amount of very hard work. And none of that has come without challenges. And these individuals have figured out how to work with these challenges and succeed. And that's what makes this report so relevant, especially at a time when India and the UK are focused on a reboot, 
and a rejuvenation of our economic partnership and our trade relationship. Early in 2020, just after Brexit, and in a scenario when the, when the global economy faced its toughest challenges, our governments recognized the need to work on our complementary strengths and bring solutions as far as possible, prosperity to both our peoples and to contribute to a revival and a sustained and sustainable growth at the global level. Not every member of the Living Bridge, um, and I'm sure there are some over here, not every one of you represents a huge industry, and not every member is uh, an SME or, an, or, or you know, you're not specifically classified, but each and every one of the contributors to that Living Bridge situation, to that output, to that success, is extremely valuable in his own right. And our economic wing, under the leadership of uh, Rohit Badwana, uh, um, is extremely valuable uh, and has developed gateways and pathways for every type of business and investor in the form of our Access India program. That is an initiative of this High Commission. We've done the handholding in the form of workshops, roundtables, and business and, and industry get-togethers in each region of the UK through the years of the lockdown, uh, through the months of the lockdown, uh, our teams have visited the different regions within the rules. We've met the people who we could in small groups and in the larger groups of 20, but we've been at it virtually and in person through the last 18 months. Today, each of you should feel proud that each of you uh, is a net contributor creating the jobs the, the hundreds of thousands that we have that have just been spoken about contributing revenues and generating trade and investment flows in both directions india today is the second largest source of foreign investment into britain and uk is the sixth largest investor in india and this weekend in fact our chief negotiator will be in london with her whole team for the second round of the India-UK trade negotiations. We have our eyes set on a target of an interim agreement in, by mid-year, uh, leading towards a comprehensive FTA by the end of the year under the leadership of the Honorable Commerce and Industries Minister of India and the UK Trade Secretary. Uh, and, and our um, Honorable Prime Minister has set us, um, uh, Honorable Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, has set us very, very um, high uh, trade targets uh, for all the Indian missions abroad, and he is personally monitoring our progress towards these goals. I'm happy to say that in the last year, those targets have been met, and now we are actually uh, setting our uh, sights on the targets for this year. So all of you have a role to play in that. You can contribute to that. We urge you to contribute to that, uh, to work with us and um, uh, help us to um, bring prosperity uh, to both the peoples on both the sides. In the last year, we've successfully brought together importers and exporters that has enabled us to achieve those results. We're working together to double our uh, trade by 2030 from our current level of 23 billion. Across the board, investments too, despite the pandemic, have increased over the last uh, two years. And that actually indicates um, a strong investor confidence in India. Um, let us hope that that trend continues on that positive trajectory. But so far, our economy has been resilient. India's economic growth in the current year has been estimated to be 9.2%. And our Prime Minister's Gati Shakti scheme reflects a very comprehensive approach to growth. Our objective is macroeconomic growth with inclusive welfare at the microeconomic level, promoting digital economy, fintech, technology-enabled development, energy transition, and importantly, climate action to make all of this sustainable. And therefore, at the beginning of our financial year, 
I urge you to seize the opportunities as government of India offers greater ease of doing business with us. Uh, you have all seen the union budget of 2022 and our high commission has shared with most of you the link to our government's um, note on the latest measures that have been taken to enhance ease of doing business with India. So to you all, the members of the Indian diaspora and the chambers and the banks and the organizations who have supported all the entrepreneurs all the way, I would um, urge you to uh, get um, into this, get become part of the whole uh, effort. And I'd like to offer you my hearty congratulations. Lord, all our countrymen and persons of Indian origin who have brought laurels to, um, uh, to, to India and to yourselves as a community here. You are at the core of the India-UK relationship. You are the bridge of steel, the living bridge, as our Honorable Prime Minister warmly describes you. And um, as envoy of my government here in London, it's my endeavor to reinforce and to enhance these strong links through outreach and engagements across the UK and, God willing, through the coming months in, in, in get-togethers such as this. I'd like to, again, um, emphasize the contribution of our friends and partners in India and here in the UK. Uh, the FIKI UK, CII UK, UK IBC, Confederation of British Industry, whose representatives are here, and um, each and every one of you present in this room, of course. I'd also like to convey a very, very important um, uh, uh, message. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to say that you represent actually a cross-section of the uh, Indian diaspora here, but you also represent a microcosm of India over here in, in the UK. You are beacons for the way ahead in every sector. And as we work together, government to government, business to business, to take our economic partnerships to the next level in just about every sector and across the spectrum, I would like to invite you all to be part of that story. You are British citizens and you represent overseas citizens of India. You are valued members of your communities and considered to be amongst the most well-integrated diaspora communities in this country, which is the case all over the world. You are good neighbors, non-interfering, not demanding, and yet when required in times of crisis, you are the ones to turn to as solid people of principle and integrity. These are your qualities that make you welcomed by people all over the world. And I'm especially proud that you have been at the forefront of nation building in this great country as well. And your diverse community represents all of India. And just as in India, you have maintained unity in diversity here as well. I would call upon you, and that's why I wanted to take this opportunity the first time I'm meeting you all in person, not to let vested interests scare up an artificial storm that scatters you into divided groups. And in your own interest, I would call upon you to be wise and maintain the cohesiveness that has been your forte and one of the secrets to your success all these decades. On a separate note, also, uh, very, very importantly, I would like to take a minute to address the question on the minds of some or many of you present here today. Governments and people around the world, without exception, are presently seized of yet another theater of hostilities and a growing humanitarian crisis. As in previous cases, Government of India has appealed to the parties involved to immediately cease violence and return to diplomacy and dialogue. We have reminded them that the global order is anchored on international law, the UN Charter, and respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of all states. And these are principles that all the member states of the UN have signed up to. We've called for respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states. 
we've called for peaceful settlement of disputes in accordance with all these principles that I have just mentioned. And we have welcomed the decision on direct dialogue at the Belarus border. We've also decided to provide urgent relief supplies, including medicines. And of course, our utmost priority over the last seven days has been the safety and security of Indian nationals, including the large number of Indian students stranded in Ukraine. Uh, I've just heard that the British Asian Trust had actually organized a field kitchen which drove from Paris to Poland and was able to give hot food to some of uh, a good number of the stranded children there. So I laud initiatives such as this. Um, you will be asked by many regarding India's position on this latest crisis. And I would invite you to see our website, keep yourselves updated. Um, it is a position that has remained consistent through the years. And we are setting an example with our own restraint and application of the same principles that we advocate in our efforts to address the complex, complex challenges in our own neighborhood. And we are constantly um, keeping our um, uh, Indian nationals in that region informed. Um, and we are updating our social media. And we would invite those among you who are interested to keep in touch. So back to where we are right now, as we celebrate this year, the 75 years of India-UK relations and work on the roadmap to 2030 under the stewardship and leadership of the External Affairs Minister of India, Dr. S. Jai Shankar, and the uh, Foreign Secretary of the UK, Madam Elizabeth Truss, I call upon you to keep the aspirations high as you work together uh, Indian and British partners to reinforce our excellent ties at all levels. With these words, I once again thank you all for your contribution and call upon you to keep working with us, with our economic wing, and to take all of our successes into a new brilliant era of trade and economic cooperation. Thank you all once again. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you very much uh, for that uh, very eloquent um, welcome address and also uh, very nicely putting in the, the the contribution of the Indian diaspora in the UK across all walks of life. Thank you very much for that. And also for uh, very thoughtfully sharing the thoughts of the Indian government on, on, on the current crisis that uh, is facing uh, in Europe. Thank you. Can I now request Baroness Usha Prasha, right honorable, Prasha, ma'am, to come and share her thoughts on the diaspora report and the thoughts of FIKI UK Council. And ma'am, you have been a very, very strong supporter of the diaspora community and especially have got some fantastic views on what the youngsters can do. So we'd love to hear a bit more from you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much indeed, Chandru, for that introduction. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, may I just say, I would like to thank you most profoundly for your very gracious hospitality and your very, very inspiring introductory comments. I was very glad to hear the way you summed up what the diaspora does here but also really about the qualities that make us so well integrated into this community. And I was also delighted to hear that you spelt out India's stance in relation to the current crises, because what really matters in this world today is the question of dialogue, diplomacy, and all the principles and values. And I think as two democracies working together, it is our responsibility to actually promote those values and principles. So I'm very grateful to you for your uh, very kind words and your very warm hospitality. And I would also like to thank our partner, Grant Thornton, team uh, led by Anut Chande for very highlighting the contribution of the, uh, of, of the Indians in the UK. And 
We all know that the Indian diaspora has gained in immense recognition for the significant contribution it makes to its host countries and to India. As the size and the spread and the influence of Indians around the world grows, the potential of the diaspora to make a substantial contribution to its adopted countries around the world to India is absolutely enormous. And of course, it was India's far-sightedness that it recognized this potential when it instituted the Parvasi Bharti Divas in 2003. And I'm very proud to say that, P that FIKI has been associated with the Parvasi Divas since its inception. And I've had the privilege of attending at least one of them. And I know what a delight it is to meet the diaspora from across the world and the welcome that's extended to the diaspora in India. Now, according to the United Nations report of 2019, India has the largest diaspora in the world with around 18 million of its citizens living in other countries. And this actually comprises about 6.4% of the total global migrant population. And as you said, India, the Indian diaspora connects India to the world. And it is heartwarming how the members of our large diaspora have well integrated into the countries and societies that they live and work in. And the, as you know, that we all have a continued to maintain very deep and abiding connections with India and its rich heritage, traditions, and culture. Someone like me, born in Kenya, of Indian heritage, still the soul connects to India. And I think as the world develops, you know, the connections are extremely strong. And as you said, they hold esteemed positions leading in from the, from the front in their respective spheres, be it in political, economic, cultural services or technology, and they retain and nurture an abiding bond and interest in staying connected with their roots. And over the decades, as you said, the relations between India and UK have evolved against the changing contours of political and economic affairs. And to your words, these relations are being rebooted. And today, as you, India is the largest diaspora community in the UK, at least 1.5 million people of Indian heritage live, work, and run businesses in, in the UK. It's probably more than 1.5, but I think it's about that number. And they, of course, contribute across the spectrum, ranging from finance and professions through arts and culture. And from my point of view, the Indian diaspora youth play an in in indispensable role in innovation and new technologies at global level. And they have been making great strides in finding innovative solutions to a large number of current problems. And, it, and they are the ones who are actually thinking about the future. And they have this sort of very innovative ways of dealing with some of the future problems. And these youth have also made a remarkable journey in innovation, technology, and creativity. And I think it's important that we actually not only motivate them, but we nurture this talent and, and support them because it's these youth of the future and the technological changes which is going to continue to bridge that particular the connection between India and, and the UK. And I think it's important that we actually focus uh, on those. Uh, so from my point of view, I think we've got to sort of, while celebrate the contribution made, we've got to make sure that we nurture the young people, particularly who are making the inroads into new technology. Now, as Chandru said, you know, we launched this report, the first report about two years ago now, it seems, you know, a wonderful event and it probably was the last event I attended before lockdown and I was actually looking at the photographs we took and I thought gosh you know it seems a long way off but it's very nice to be here with everybody in, in person but as I say the first report celebrated the business and the entrepreneurship of the Indian diaspora in the UK but this particular report is celebrating generations of, uh, of diaspora success. And I think we wanted to go deeper into some of that. And it's important that it's important to just not look at the economic contribution made. It also brings out the spotlight on the contribution that the diaspora make beyond business. 
uh, including new generation of British Indians making waves in the fields of art, science, sport, and politics. Because to my mind, business is underpinned by some of these, and these values really matter, and culture is an important part of that. Because if you just focus on economic relations, it can become quite a transactional relationship. And I think it's got to be underpinned by winning the hearts and minds. And I think the diaspora connection is that living bridge, you know, which make it much more tangible in that sense. And I think we've also tried to look at the geographical spread of the diaspora here. And it also looks at the challenges that they currently face. And I think it's important that looking to the future, while we celebrate the successes we've made, it's important to see that this is an unfolding story. And how do we make sure that we can continue to make and deepen our commitment here? And I think towards the end, there are certain pointers that we've actually given, and I'm sure Anaju will repeat those. But there are a couple that I want to pick out because to me, I think they're important. Because as we saw during the pandemic, the Indian community rose to the challenge, businesses rose to the challenge, and a lot of money was given And you know, when there are crises. But I think we've got to make the social corporate responsibility and philanthropy an integral part of our businesses. I'm a trustee of an organization called Beacon Collaborative, which is very much involved in promoting philanthropy. And it also, to some extent, ties with Fiki's origin because, you know, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said business has to have purpose. And that was the genesis of Fiki. So I think it's important to make giving and philanthropy an integral part of, of it, not just respond to crises, because that also means that you are giving to the community where you are living. So it's giving and taking in, in, in that sense. And that leads me to another point about local engagement. Because while we look at the numbers in the House of Lords and Parliament and so on, and I think the number of councils locally, but I was president of the community foundations, and I tried really hard to get our communities to get involved and have local engagement. And I think as we look at the regions and the development, I think that regional engagement at local level is going to be extremely important going forward, because as you you know that Fiki has been around looking at regional, regionally even making links with regions in the UK and regions in, in, in India. And I think the local engagement with the communities is extremely important. So I think there are pointers that we need to really think in terms of young people, you know, and other things. I'm sure that Anoj will actually give you the analysis of the figures. But all I'm saying is that I'm very proud that we are associated with this report. And I really want to thank you, Madam, for, for actually hosting us in such a gracious manner and Grand Thought and Anuj, your team. And I think we have two young ladies who actually helped us work. I would like you to stand up and, and, and just so, because they were the ones who actually volunteered and, 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 and actually helped us um, with a report because I'm a great believer in giving, giving a leg up to young people. So it was, I'm delighted that they helped with their report. And I hope you will enjoy reading the report. It's something we can build on. Um, but I'm grateful that we had the opportunity to actually do this in person. So thank you very much indeed. Mm. Thank you, Baroness, for those inspiring words, as always. Um, innovation, technology, youngsters, healthcare, it's all at the forefront of what the diaspora community is known for, isn't it, ma'am? And thank you for, for so eloquently putting it across. And also um, um, your, your thoughts on what, what we should be doing for the society in terms of philanthropy. I think that's a very important aspect. Thank you for bringing it into light once again. Uh, without much ado, I'm now going to invite my colleague Anuj Chande, uh, head of the South Asia Business Group at Grant Thornton, uh, to, to share the findings of the report before we formally launch the report. Uh, as, as, as you all are aware, we did the last report in 2020. We started working on this report in March 2021 exactly. So it's taken exactly one year for us to come out with this report. It's taken a bit of time, but uh, the... the uh, the report and the results are truly outstanding. 
and Anuj will talk more about it. Over to you, Anuj. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chandru, for that uh, introduction. Um, Your Excellency High Commissioner Gayati Sar Kumar, uh, Deputy High Commissioner Sujit Ghosh, Baroness Usha Prasha, distinguished uh, guests uh, who are here both physically and online, uh, thank you for taking time out on a Friday evening. I know Friday evening is not best of times to host a launch of a report, but uh, I'm so glad that you have all made a real effort to, to be here. And for some of some of us, uh, stay, stayed up till 12.30 in the morning in India. So I'm very grateful uh, to, to those individuals. Um, before I give you the, the highlights of the second report, uh, I just want to say that I'm particularly proud that... Uh, we are doing this report together, together with Fiki. But uh, having been involved with helping work with the Indian diaspora for the last 30 years, it gives me great, great uh, sense of uh, pride to actually talk about the diaspora and actually celebrate the success of the diaspora. But not just as uh, uh, Baroness and High Commissioner have said, not just in a business context, but in terms of the other walks of life. Uh, and there are many representatives here who are not necessarily business people, uh, whether it's arts, medicine, science, culture, uh, food, uh, that all make a very positive contribution uh, to this to this host country uh, and have integrated well into the society. We're very proud to be associated with FIKI and we thank uh, uh, Baroness and uh, Param Shah, uh, the head of FIKI in the UK, uh, for collaborating with us and uh, we're particularly uh, ple uh, pleased and very grateful to the High Commission for hosting this occasion. Uh, I'd like to particularly pay tribute to Rohit Badwana, who is the first Secretary uh, Economic Affairs and Press and Information, who has helped us put this uh, event together. Uh, if it wasn't his support, I don't think this, this event would have, would have taken place. So Rohit, many, many thanks uh, to you uh, for that. So you've, you've heard about the fact that the first report was more about the quantitative aspects of, uh, of the diaspora contribution. And in fact, Mami was your predecessor that actually instigated that report. She said to us one day, uh, I remember Chandra and I were sitting in the, in, in, on, the, on the third floor, and she said, you know, everybody talks about this contribution of the Indian diaspora, but nobody's ever quantified it. Uh, Baroness knows full well that it's very, very difficult, and it's quite a challenging thing to have done. But we managed to do something, but again, as Chandru, my colleague, had mentioned, it's just the tip of the iceberg. The numbers he quoted are just the tip of the iceberg, and you know the figures are actually even more than, than, than that. And, and, and as years go by, they'll, 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 they'll grow. Um, but this report, we really wanted to make it a bit more qualitative, dig a bit deeper into some of the sectors that uh, uh, Indian-owned diaspora businesses are, are in, uh, but also... Um, uh, look at some of the areas of contribution contribution beyond uh, beyond business uh, that, that, that have been mentioned to here. So I just want to give you some key highlights. The actual report will be available to you uh, as you leave this evening. Um, so take it with you. Hopefully it'll be some good weekend reading for some of you. Some of you. Um, in terms of sector-wise, the first report highlighted that uh, something like 84% of Indian diaspora businesses were involved in five or six key sectors. Those were real estate and hospitality, healthcare, food and beverage, pharmaceuticals and life sciences, retail and financial services. Some of you are, who, are, who are in those sectors are, are here today, including some of our interviewees are here today, running very successful uh, businesses. In this report, we interviewed, uh, as, as mentioned, 14 uh, such businesses. We took a well-established uh, business that was in that sector, but we also took an emerging business in that sector. So you've got a good cross-blend uh, of, of, of businesses in the sector. But one thing I want to emphasize is that these are just examples of uh, diaspora businesses. There are many, many more, including uh, many of you here today that uh, are not in the report in terms of case studies, but you have, you have equally demonstrated success in, in, in this sector. And, and what was interesting that came out of the, the, the case studies, what, there were some common themes. Uh, so, for example, the importance of family support was key. Family plays a very, very integral part to the success of uh, most of the Indian diaspora businesses. 
I think the other thing was determination to succeed against all, all odds. You'll see in the report, there are many examples of people who have faced challenges uh, as they tried to grow their businesses, but they actually were determined and they actually uh, uh, were determined to make the success of those businesses. Uh, and I think the, 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 the last thing is the strong work ethic that comes out. Uh, it's so, so uh, ingrained in the, in, 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 in our, uh, in our, in our, in our psyche, and uh, without that hard work ethic, I don't think a lot of these businesses would have uh, would have would have succeeded. Um, as uh, has been mentioned, we looked at uh, the regional spread of uh, the diaspora, um, and by all accounts, we we sort of our research has helped us. But we think it's 1.5 was the last census done in 2011. We believe, based upon other stuff we have public information we see that it's more like 1.7 million uh, is, is, is the number, but 2021 census will hopefully come out shortly next year or something. We'll get an idea of what that number is. Um, but what's interesting is that regionally, the footprint hasn't changed dramatically uh, from, from 2011. Uh, we, we looked at the region. London still accounts for something like between 40 and 45% of the diaspora either live or work in, 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 in London. Uh, the West Midlands and East Midlands would be the next uh, popular sector. Um, and what we are finding, what we did find through the research in the report, is that there are new communities forming in places like Cardiff, uh, Slough, Reading, Milton Keynes. Um, the, um, the, the, the other thing that uh, we, we, we did through our report is that of that 1.7 million that, that with, I, I mentioned, the figure I mentioned, uh, it's our belief that there's a generational change. So the second and third generation are forming a much more significant part of that 1.7 million. Uh, so there is that generational uh, shift, which I think is actually creates a very powerful economic force because you've got the second and third generation with still ingrained with the Eastern values of hard work ethics and family support, but you've got the Western education and the Western upbringing. So that combination, we believe, is going to be a very powerful economic force going into the next uh, next decades. Uh, having said that, our report highlights that there are certain challenges that arise from that generational shift uh, that, 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 that we're seeing. Um, we're finding, and this is again through both uh, the research we've done, but our own practical experience, uh, particularly my own practical experience having advised for 30 years, is that there is a succession planning has become much more complex. It's not always about somebody being capable or have the capacity uh, to, to, uh, to step in into the family business. Uh, many don't want to necessarily join the family business or they're not capable. Um, and the other thing is that you're getting the gender shift and you're getting wives and daughters who are looking to join the family business. And sometimes the first generation has, has difficulty in accepting that, that particular role. Um, and I think, again, uh, on that whole gender point, I think we're still not very good at gender diversity when it comes to our businesses. Um, I mean, on, you know, we, in our report, we have, uh, you know, try to be as diverse as we can, but it was a challenge trying to find uh, success stories and, and, and when we know that there are. So I think that is a big challenge which we need to think about going forward is that we need to shift that, that, that gender diversity uh, to, the, to the other area. I think the other thing that, that has comes out again is that um, the generational differences in terms of approach. So for example, the first generation was not really that keen on private equity or taking debt whereas the second generation is much more willing to do that. So again, that is something which is creating friction, is creating, uh, creating challenges. I think the other thing is that sibling rivalry, um, sibling rivalry happens in all family businesses, not particularly uh, in, in Indian um, businesses, but I think you're finding the situation where generally speaking, the eldest was uh, the automatic heir to the whole business. Uh, you're finding that that is changing and that Sometimes, in fact, it's the second person or even the youngest brother that actually is more capable and is then uh, taking on the challenge of, of running the business. I think the other thing also is that there is a lack of involving non-family members. Um, and I think it's always been, you know, 
you might have to have the family involved in all the top positions. And I think we're seeing again a change where non-family members are getting involved in senior management positions. But again, there's always this challenge as to how does that professional interact with the family member who is the family sponsor? And there's often some frictions and, and, and issues there. So I mean, those are just some of the some of the uh, things that we have found throughout through our research, and you'll see further details in the report. Um, I think as we as we uh, mentioned earlier, we've looked beyond business. Um, our report really highlights the contribution made in all the areas we, we've we've talked about. Um, and and you know, for example, we uh, it's it's amazing that a British Sikh uh, Army officer, uh, Harpreet Chandi, 32 years old. Yeah, became the first woman of color to trek the South Pole, South Pole unsupported. I mean, that's just remarkable, you know. Um, and there are many other examples where we have, you know, been at the forefront uh, in non-business uh, contribution, whether it's uh, politics, whether it's art, whether it's culture. Uh, I mean, we have 50, we, we know that the two offices of, of state are, 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 are Indian origin, and we know that... Uh, the chairman of COP26, who's a cabinet member, is also of Indian origin. Uh, we've got 15 MPs in, in, in the House of Commons. We've got 25 peers, which is well above what, what uh, it would normally be. Uh, we know also that in terms of the health service, there's 32,000 uh, people of Indian origin that work, work in the health service. So I think in, in conclusion, I would say that, you know, the first report was a very quantitative report. This is a much more uh, qualitative report. Uh, it gives uh, a flavor of what is what are some of the challenges are, what we can uh, look forward to in the future. And I think with uh, this year being an important year in terms of uh, the negotiation of the UK-India FTA, I do think that the Indian diaspora have a key role to play in that living bridge which has been talked about and being uh, the best ambassadors uh, both ways in, in, in encouraging investment into the UK but also encouraging investment uh, into India. Uh, and we, as Grant Thornton, look forward uh, to continuing to be involved in that. Uh, and once again, uh, I'd like to thank our partners, uh, Fiki, for uh, being involved in uh, helping us produce this report. And again, uh, Your Excellency, to thank you and your team for hosting this, this event. And uh, please enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anuj. I think you have whetted the appetite well enough for everyone to now really get their hands on that report and, and read more about it in mm -hmm. detail. Means, uh, I was going to talk about Polar Preet. Uh, that's a great example of, of beyond business. Uh, and there are many more such examples in the report. So without much ado, can we now formally launch the report? Can I request uh, High Commissioner, uh, please join us on the stage. Baroness, please join us. Um, Deputy High Commissioner, Mr. Ghosh, please join us. Uh, and uh, Rohit and Param, please be here for the launch of the, the formal part of uh, the proceedings today to launch the report. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Baroness Prasher, uh, Anuj, uh, Deputy High Commissioner uh, Rohit and Param for joining us to launch this report. Um, before we bring the formal part of the proceedings today to an end, can I request 
uh, Deputy High Commissioner Mr. Sujit goes to come along and please share your uh, concluding remarks. Thank you very much, sir. Namaskar, everybody. On behalf of the High Commission of India, I thank you all for being present on this occasion. I would like to especially thank High Commissioner, Her Excellency Gayatri Sarkumar and Baroness Parasha for joining us this evening. Uh, as you've heard uh, during the course of this evening, the Indian diaspora in the UK occupies a unique place. As pointed out by our speakers this evening, the contribution of the Indian diaspora in enriching British culture, society and politics has been immense. In fundamental ways, they have shaped their karma bhumi, karma bhumi and contributed to the advancement of India's civilizational ethos of pluralism, coexistence and oneness, which we call Vesudeva Katumbukam in this part of the world. The accomplishments of the Indian diaspora in the economic, professional and educational domains are noteworthy and inspire us all. The Indian diaspora has provoked a new appreciation of India and acted as a living bridge, as many of our speakers mentioned this evening, of understanding and engagement between their Karma Bhumi and Matra Bhumi. Before I conclude, allow me to quote from India's former Prime Minister Atal Vihari Vajpayee's address at the inauguration of the first Prabhasi Bhartiya Divas. While addressing the diaspora, he said, and I quote, you can project the truth about India to the world in a credible and effective manner. Misleading, one-sided and negative pictures are often put out due to bias, ignorance or design. Your familiar familiarity with the Indian reality and with the perspectives of your adopted society equips you to correct such mis misrepresentations. You could project a positive image of India, not as propaganda, but as a true reflection of the reality on the ground. High Commission of India in London, under, under the leadership of the High Commissioner, has always responded to the expectations of the diaspora and would continue to do so. Thank you all again for being present on this occasion. Thank you, Fiki. Thank you, Grant Thornton. And last but not the least, thanks to all my colleagues in the High Commission, especially from the economic uh, wing who made this event happen. Thank you and a very good evening. Thank you, uh, Deputy High Commissioner, for those concluding remarks. Uh, with that, uh, we bring to an end the, the virtual session. So uh, thank you very much to all who joined us online for the launch of this report. The report is now able to be downloaded from the Grand Thornton website or from uh, the Fiki bike platform where you're watching this event now. There is a download button where you can download the report right away. For those who joined us in person today, please don't forget to take a copy of the report when you are going back home. Thank you very much and please do stay back for dinner. Thank you very much and have a nice evening.